Hello, everybody. Welcome to the University of Dutch, uh, along with my co-host today, uh, Dr. John. John, how you doing? I am doing very good. Dirty Dutch, good. how you doing? Well, you'll notice that today, uh, how's, how's that mustache, John? Pretty awesome. Good, huh? Yeah, it's awesome. you notice that today what we're doing, and I'm kind of outside, that's why you may be, be able to hear that car outside, uh, but this is the first time we have tried video, right, John? That is correct. First time ever. And it could be the last time. <laughs> <laughs> they say, God, we enjoy the show, but take that video off. My God. So anyway, and yeah, you know, I actually went out and straightened up my mustache a little bit so uh, I can get it to, to extend from side to side. But anyway, uh, hey, this is our second show on the on the brand. Second show on the brand. And, uh, you know, I, uh, last week, people, you got to listen every week because sometimes my stuff interact with each other. Did you ask me last week about a, sh a show we did about the, uh, the electrified cage? Yes. That was last week. And Fire answered, Russo. Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, actually the Fire Russo chant was not only that night, but it was somewhere else. Really, the fire Russo chant started in Orlando, and uh, it was during the Stairway to Heaven match. Oh yep. my God! He admitted that, that match is horrible too. Yeah, he, he, it, so, yeah. he did admit it was horrible, but it was it was terrible. And I looked out on the floor, <laughs> and the fans said, "Fire Russo, <laughs> Go. Fire Russo." Oh yep. my God. And then I saw him walking through and he was saying like, he didn't say nothing, but his face was saying, fuck them son of bitches. And Dixie was on the floor and I kind of felt sorry for him a little bit. But the other thing, the electrified cage, I still stand by my answer. It wasn't my idea. It was Jeff's idea. And he, he might even say, no, it wasn't my idea. It was you guys. But I didn't even like the, I didn't even like the, the tone of it when it was first suggested, Jeff just thought it'd be something good to add on the card. Yeah, electrified cage sounds great till you try to put it in action. So, did you ever use uh, an electrified cage in Puerto Rico? Hell no, we didn't have electricity. <laughs> I could use candlelight cage, maybe. <laughs> Where did Jeff get that idea from? Was it Mexico or did he get that idea from Japan? Uh, he probably got it from Japan. He read about it, I guess. I don't know. But and I had heard about it, but I, I but I heard about it from Japan. But it takes a lot of planning to pull off something like that. I don't know a lot of Japan stuff I didn't much like, but but the electrified cage there was no need for it. To tell you the truth, it was the Dudley Boys versus somebody. LAX was it LAX? Okay, and. Uh, but but whatever I I stayed as far away from from from, from that match as I could because Vince, what I, well Vince said TNA wouldn't be able to to pull it off like if TNA were to do that cage which obviously they didn't he said the production value wise they would screw it up too yeah well they did that's what I call it and hey I'm not knocking TNA I worked for them eight years I like those people. But sometimes it was the gang that couldn't shoot straight. They would just, they trip over their own feet. And sometimes Dixie would bring in people in the office from the day, a secretary and say, what did you like about the show? And I'm thinking, what, what are you going to do? You're going to sit there and you got to sit there and listen to her. But she doesn't know what she's talking about. Plus, you know she's been forced to come in there and doesn't want to be in there either. But that was working at TNA. It was crazy stuff. Hey, let me catch you up on something. Yes. What happened on January the 6th? And let me remind the people. People, when you, when you hear me and John talk, it's like two wrestlers getting in a car, making a trip, which we should be doing today, but I kind of forgot about it. Uh, and they're talking about the news that has just happened. Now, 
the big blow up in Washington, D.C. last January the 6th took everybody by surprise. It took me by surprise. And I was wondering, and I got to thinking, how in the hell did this happen? Because, John, you know, they have heard since the election that a big uh, event was coming to Washington. Correct or no? Yes. It's not, like the, it's not like the Secret Service or the Capitol Police or, or the FBI. They didn't know these people were not coming. But still, the, the magnitude of the people, the number of people that showed up surprised them. Which, and, and, but then when you think about the number of people were there, uh, it, it surprised you. There was like a couple hundred thousand people there, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what they said, yep. That's, and so let's say they didn't recognize how many people was going to be there. The next thing that surprised me is how did they get into the building? How did they do that? Seems like everyone kind of moved aside and let them get in. That's what it looked well, like. Seemed like one clip I saw. It showed the cops, I guess, capital the police, pushing the barricades aside and telling them, "Come on in, come on," and let them up closer. Then they got up close and they lined up. But you can't have three, four, five thousand people trying to get in the building, and you only got like three hundred to keep them out. You can't do it. So they got in, and I didn't think it was that bad till I finally saw some of the some of the other images they had. You know, they killed that cop. Yeah. Did you see him do that? Yep. They pulled him off the steps and Yep. Crazy. I mean, they need to go to they need to go to jail for life for that. Hey, listen, I kinda agreed with uh, I kinda agreed with the protest. Do it. But I do not agree with the violence. I don't agree with beating things down. I don't agree with, you know, treating that cop the way they did. They killed him. So, but there was no reason for it to happen. And then, now the next day, the chief of police got fired. He should have gotten fired. If he is that lax in his job that he can't. What if you were a Rand and you think about how could we get in there? What a big deal for them, right? If they could get inside there and hold them hostage, then blow the place up. Right. Now they know how to get in. It's, it's crazy. Now they have another one coming up. And I'm going to get back on wrestling in a minute. I promise, folks. But they're going to have another one coming up next week on January the 20th, the day of the inauguration. But I think they have like 20,000 federal troops in Washington, D.C. You know the last time they had 20,000 federal troops in Washington, D.C.? No. Can't Civil, think War. Of it. Civil War. Oh, geez, Louise. Okay. The Civil War. This has never happened before, nor I don't think it will ever happen again. So it was kind of that they're lucky that most of those people didn't mean harm. Most of them, but some of them did. Now, were they all white nationalists? Well, I don't even know what a white nationalist is, to tell you the truth. But all, were they all violent people? No, they weren't. I do think they had some some other uh, protest groups in there with them. I think BLM was in there with them somewhere. I think Antifa was. They were in there stirring up trouble. And then, of course, you can't you can't let the uh, you can't let the Republicans off because they were in there causing trouble too. It's, it's just crazy. The stupidest thing I've ever, not stupid, but dangerous, very dangerous. Right, it was, so. li it was literally like dark Knight rises. The, uh, the Batman movie. That's what it looked like. Where like Bane and all his guys were storming the, uh, the Capitol there. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, so January the 20th, what do you think I happened there? I have no idea. I didn't see the January 6th events happening, so I have no clue. I hope uh, a lot of nothing, but who knows? Well, I don't think much can happen. You know, when you got 20,000 troops, but still 20,000 troops, they had like a couple hundred, I, I heard, a couple hundred thousand protesters there. 
I mean, that's a lot of people to control. It really is. But but the actual riot stopped, and they tried to blame Trump for all of it. I don't believe Trump can be blamed for all of it. He can be blamed for getting them there. I don't think he told them to bust in the door and, you know, take over the building. I didn't hear him say that. But, of course, anything they can blame Trump with, and, yeah, he was probably the root cause of it. I agree, I agree with that. But the other stuff, hey, you might, you, you might want to look at your own system, Congress. I mean, the people are not only mad about the election, they're mad at you guys. They're mad at Congress. And, okay, here's, here's my idea how to fix Congress. Term limits. You agree or no? 100%, yes. If you get a term limit on president and vice presidents, you need to have it on senators. You need to have it on representatives. And the last group I'm going to add in there is the Supreme Court. Add your Supreme Court in there. Now you've got uh, the three branches of government that have term limits. And that's what it was built for anyway, is for not career politicians, but uh, citizen politicians. Because yep. they wanted doctors to do it, they wanted lawyers to do it, and they wanted farmers to do it, and scientists and teachers. Not all that their whole life is based around politics. All right. So uh, give me something that's on your mind, John, and then I'm gonna get the I'm gonna get in the, the root of this thing. So just a thing I was curious about. So 1995 WWF. We were kind of talking before about it wasn't Smoky Mountain WWF, it was Smoky Mountain of Puerto Rico was the WWF. How did you get into WWF in '95 with Vince? Did Vince know who you were? And like, yeah. how did like how did that go? Oh, yeah, Vince knew who I was. Well, I, first of all, they were. I went to the front door and I bought a ticket to the building, <laughs> and then I went to the back and said, "Hey, I want to see Vince." <laughs> no, that's a joke. No. No, I used to, of course, like everybody else, because that was the time in the cycle of wrestling that it died for most people, for yep. most performers. It died late 80s, early 90s, because you really only had two groups running, or maybe three, if you figure in ECW. You had WWF and WCW. And ECW, that's what you had running. So unless you worked for them on a regular basis, you couldn't say you were making a livelihood in the wrestling business. So with all those places to work or to gain employment gone, you, your choices were limited. So I used to call WWE quite often. And I went to Puerto Rico in 95, and I came home for Christmas. And when I was home, I uh, just, because I, I made these calls like, it was almost like every three, two, three weeks. And it got so many, I called so many times, I forgot what the receptionist's name was. She knew my voice. So I'd call up. Wow. And she'd say, WWE or WWF. And I'd say, hey, is Vince in? Hi, Dutch. How are you doing? She knew me. And then, of course, she'd always say, and she'd kind of laugh because she knew I knew the drill. Oh, he's not available right now, blah, 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 blah. So, but I, I forgot. I don't know how I got through to him, but I think I asked for J.J. Dillon one time. She said, oh, yeah, J.J.'s in. So I got him on the phone. I said, wow, this is the deepest I've been ever. <laughs> so... And I said, hey, JG, and I had heard that Ron and Don Harris were going to WWF. And, you know, their, their talking is not their strong point. So I got him on the phone. I said, hey, I got an idea for you. What? I said, won't you let me manage those guys and bring us in as a group? And he thought about it. He said, that's not a bad idea. He said, well, let me, let me send it to the old man, which meant Vince. I said, okay. He called me back 30 minutes later. He said, Vince, love the idea. You start on such and such a day. I thought he was friggin' ribbon. I said, what? 
start when? And he'd give me a date, which should be a lesson to everybody. Don't uh, call anybody up and say, can you use me? Have an idea for them to use you. So I had an idea, put me with the Harris boys. Let me manage them. Okay, now they're not thinking of it. Now, when they think about that, that's the way they're thinking of it. And it's easier to put together. So for anybody who wants WWE to use them, give them an idea. But when you give them the idea, make them think that it's their idea to begin with and take it from there. And that's what I did. So that's how I got there. And then this is, this is how, and this is how I got. Oh yeah, he got me. I, I couldn't believe it. So I worked there about, I don't know, eight or nine months, and and Don Don Harris, he's the older twin. So, you know, Don's the oldest. I mean, Ron's the oldest, <clears throat> but Don's the meanest. <clears throat> Somebody asked me one time, who's the meaner of the twins? I said, hell, it's Don, Donnie. Donnie, I have to kill you. Ronnie's <laughs> like the thinker of the bunch, you know. Yep. And he, yeah, you know, he's a little more intellectual. <laughs> yep. But uh, but anyway, Donnie, uh, Ronnie got upset about something, the way they were using him or whatever. And he just up one night at Monday Night Raw, I forgot where it was. I think it was somewhere in New York. And he just left. And we, I was going back to maybe New Jersey with Donnie in the car. And I said, well, where's Ron? He said, well, he quit. I went, what? He quit? He said, yeah, you didn't know? I said, no, I didn't know. He didn't tell me. So then <clears throat> I think Donnie quit the next week. So I'm sitting there without anybody. I mean, they were kind of paying me a little bit, but, uh, that's when the contracts were all messed up and nobody was making money then because WCW was kicking butt. And so that's how I got with Bradshaw. I went to TV one night and I'm sitting there and Bradshaw came in and he was going to make his audition uh, appearance. And I got to talking to him and I said, Hey, why don't you let me walk you to the ring tonight and to see how it feels? He said, Oh, it's fine with me. So I forgot who came in. I think Bruce Preacher came in, or I think it was Bruce. I said, Bruce, is it okay if I went with uh, Bradshaw to the ring tonight? He said, go ahead, pal. <laughs> so I went to the ring. They liked it. And then I ended up with Bradshaw for another year. So that's how it started. There was no big plans behind it or anything. It, it was just one of those things that organically happened because it was there and that's that's how it came about any more and questions kind of, and that i'm just saying those guys really fit you for whatever reason like you look like you would manage the harris brothers and justin hawk bradshaw oh, yeah. you know what i mean it's just if they fit you perfectly so good casting well good it was on my end but good yep. yes, uh, exactly. do you remember a match i had with tracy smothers uh, god bless him it was in houston texas or somewhere down in texas you remember that when I lost three falls to him in less than three minutes? Yeah, why Why did you job out so quickly? Because I wanted to. Really? Hey, hey if you're going to put some, Who left the heat? Who left the ring there uh, with more heat than I, I had when I went in? Me, I did. Me and John did. And it, it helped. That's, that's the way you can help both people. See, because, see, a heel is one of... Heel has to be always the victim. A great heel is always the victim of somebody else. Of somebody's their jealousy or they're mad at them. And that's what makes a great heel. So when he went in and he beat me like in eight seconds or whatever, you know, I kicked up and no, it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. And when I got to Mike, everybody shut up. What's this? They'd never seen it before. So we did it again, almost the repeat of the first one. Yeah, he did it twice. Now it's not a fluke. Now they're kind of believing in him. Now the third time he started hitting on me, then Bradshaw hit. Then I think Sabio hit. Now we work that little four minutes there worked us into a month long deal. That's how simple it can be sometimes. So I, I, I didn't mind doing that stuff because 
it, when I was a heel, I didn't mind losing because it's according to how you it, uh, it's according to how you beat beat your heel. You can't leave him laying because if you leave him laying, what's left? Nothing. If you leave him laying, next thing you got to do is show him show him asleep in the bed. And that's what it is. But uh, and somebody even asked me. They said, "Why did you do that finish?" I said, "Cause I suggested it." Really? <laughs> when I suggested the finish, the people looked at me like, "Why would you do this?" Because that's the old to me the old way of thinking. You know, you got to work for the team too. Anyway, and I mean, I, I knew I was just there for a short amount of time. Anyway, I knew I wasn't going to be up there in the main event. So let me I, and I like Tracy. So let me help him along. So any any more questions? So were you a part of the booking committee for the WWE in uh, 95, 96? Were you booking at all? No, I was not. And there's a reason for that. It's because I was on the road three days a week, and then they would want me to go after, after Monday Night Raw. They would want me to go back to Stanford for two days for the booking meetings, then go home, and then leave again Friday morning to go back out on the road. That meant that, and they didn't mention any more money. Oh, wow. If they'd, if they'd have mentioned more money, <clears throat> yeah, I may have been a little more receptive to it. But no, I'm not going to work six days and beat myself up and just to go back out there on the road and go through it again. Hey, booking is, is not hard, and, but it can be hard. It can be very, very frustrating especially when you're not surrounded by people who kind of understand uh, your philosophy. And I'm not saying my philosophy is better. I just understood it better. And I could lay stuff out that kind of highlighted where I wanted to go. But my booking would go like this, but it, was, it had a lot of off ramps. I could get off anywhere and then I could join anywhere. But see the WWF way was, it was like, concrete this is it and it's not changing and i can see that some of their programs because they have to book some of that stuff two months out i, I got that man it's very very difficult it is okay so what what do we want to talk about this week john well, <laughs> some of the we, craziest places i ever wrestled yeah i was gonna say some strange places you've wrestled for sure well this was early in my career. I was in Atlanta and the booker who was Tom Renesto at the time. The assassin. The assassin, the assassin number two. Number two. Yep. He was one. People have asked me that. Not according to Jody Hamilton. He says well, even though well, he was younger, he was assassin one and Tom was assassin two, according to Jody. Well, I I heard him be announced. It was always assassin one was Tom. Because he was the first bolo, I think. Yes. Yep. He was. Yeah. And the bolos turned into the assassins. And Jody may say he's one or two. I'm not going to doubt him. But I always thought, in my mind, Tom was one. Jody was two. He said a lot of people say that. Yeah. They say what I say. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Well, that's just the way I saw it. So, but I don't know, but a great, what a great team they were. Even back in those days, great, great team. I mean, they did a lot of, they didn't do a lot of cheap heat. They just beat a guy up and kept him from tagging and kept him from tagging. And finally, you know, I mean, the, the vibe, the atmosphere around a wrestling match in those days, I mean, it looked more like a legitimate contest than what it might look today. And they would keep the guy in his corner, and they had two ways of getting the people up. They would make a false tag, and the referee wouldn't see it. And then when the referee was putting the other guy back, this asshole would just beat the crap out of the guy. People go nuts. And then, of course, they'd, they'd make the big comeback at the end. People were going nuts, and they would pull out the, the loaded hood, put it in the I mean, that loaded gimmick, put it in the hood, headbutt them, 
and then they'd win or they'd find her, they'd do something. But they had a lot of heat, drew a lot of money. And they were different than other heels. They wouldn't, they wouldn't holler. You've heard their interviews, right? Oh, yeah. I yep. mean, they, they talked very, like, educated men. Hey, a story one time I wrote this about, <clears throat> I wrote this on my my website, and and I'll tell it real quick, but I was I had to, I was going to Carrollton, Georgia one Saturday night in Atlanta because we do Atlanta TV on Saturday morning. And then we'd go to Columbus TV and then we'd go to a, to a house show. Sometimes you'd work three times on Saturday. But I didn't have Columbus. I was just going from, uh, from Atlanta to Carrollton and I got started late. I was heading up there and I had a flat tire. And some of those back roads, I was... I was 40 miles from nowhere. So, and I had nobody to call. And <clears throat> finally, this guy in a truck stopped and picked me up. <clears throat> I was actually hitchhiking to the matches, like a big star would. So he picked me up and he was, he said, I picked you up. He had a real Southern accent. I picked you up because I kind of recognized you. He said, I, I used to go by my real name there. He said, you that Wayne Cowan boy, ain't you? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's me. Well, what happened? I told him. He said, well, okay. Where are you in luck? I'm going right to the building. So we was going up there, and he says, and this way wrestling fans used to ask you things. He said, I need to ask you a question. question. And you know what the question is. Is the, is the business fake? But it wasn't that. He said, who are them damn, damn assassin boys? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, listen, <clears throat> you know, you won't tell nobody? Said, nope, nope, won't tell nobody. It's safe for me. I said, if I tell you, you won't tell nobody. Well, you nope, nope. I said, no, as soon as I tell you, you'll go tell somebody. No, I, I swear, I swear I won't do it. Which is like saying, I'll do it the first person I find. Yep. That's what he was saying. So I told him they were actually wanted for armed robbery and attempted murder in California and they came down south to get out and get arrested and he said really and he bought the story love it yes nice so we pulled up to the building and he let me out and, I, and some people were waving at him I said, that was his buddies there he said I come every Saturday night he used to tell me <clears throat> and as soon as I went to the building you know that was the first thing he told him now, he was he was a star amongst his friends. So that was a story it. that uh, it's a great story. It, it, it really is. So what were we talking about? Some of the things places I've wrestled. Yeah. So where did Tom yeah. make you wrestle? You said it was a crazy place down in Atlanta. Where was it? Like what? Like what was the the venue? Or you know where where was this uh, odd, strange place? Well, well, it's not just one. I mean, I've wrestled some strange places like. <clears throat> The Atlanta, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Whoa. Okay. Interesting. So they only, we only took four guys there. We would have, we would have three matches, two singles, and a tag match. And then it was over. So we went in there and it, it was weird going into a, hell, I never even been inside a jail. Going in Where there the and you, were the prisoners into it or not really? Uh, some were. See, in prison, you'll, you'll find out. I'll, I'll tell you another story in a second here. <clears throat> but uh, we went in this place and we wrestled on a baseball field in front of these, like the bleachers. Uh, and they could come to it or not. Most of them came to it just because there was nothing else to do. What else are you going to do in prison? You eat or go to bed or go play cards. So a lot of, a lot of them probably had about 1,500 people out there, I guess. But I looked up in, in the corner of the stands, and there was an empty spot, like a whole corner empty. And one guy was sitting up there, and he was reading some mail. Or, and I'm, I remember asking one of the guards, I says, uh, who's... Who's that guy? And he went, <clears throat> you ever heard of a, a gangster named Traficante? 
No. Mm-mm. Big time Miami gangster. This is a federal, federal prison. And he had that corner up there. And nobody would get close to him. And they would be people on the outside. They'd be two guys on his right and two guys in front of him because he was in the corner. Nobody could get close to that guy. I think his name was Traficante. I can't remember. I looked it up later. Yeah, and he was big, big, big time gangster. So and I don't know when he got out. But, uh, and I probably spent like five hours there, six hours in there that day. It was a Sunday too. So I spent my Sunday, my my day of my Sabbath, wrestling in front of a bunch of damn criminals. But And here's another one. I wrestled in front of, in Kentucky, another prison called, uh, it was, <clears throat> it was a maximum security prison. And I can't remember the town, LaGrange, Kentucky. So, and we went there and it was cold one day and it was a Tuesday afternoon because we were on our way to Louisville. But instead of going north on 65, you just make east, uh, you make west a little bit, about 30 miles, and you end up in LaGrange where the prison is. And I think the matches, matches were about like two o'clock or so. And we wrestled in there. <clears throat> now, I'm, and we wrestled in front of a gym. So we go in there, and the first thing you hear, first thing you notice, or I notice, is the noise. It's clang, clang, bam, people screaming, hollering, hollering, you know, banging stuff around. I mean, and that goes on, they say, all night long. How can you sleep in that place, I'm thinking. So, and then another another uh, thing I remember is the smell of Lysol to clean the floors, I guess. It was strong. So, <clears throat> and then when we went down the hallway, we, we were actually passing the individual sales and people were saying shit to you and what the fuck you doing? Hey, motherfucker, I hate you. Or... But anyway, we got in this floor and we went back into a little room right in the back and it was me and Bill Dundee and the Bobby Fulton and Tommy, what was Rogers. his name? Tommy, Tommy Rogers. Rogers. Yeah. What were their names? The Fantastics. Yeah. We going to wrestle them. And let me tell you, in prison, the good, the bad guys are the baby faces. It's reversed. So when I, I went to that. the ring and they announced me, I had a big cheer. They loved me. Then they announced Tommy Rogers. Oh, they booed the shit out of him. And he had never heard that before. But I had just told him in the dressing room, that's, that's what he can expect. But he had never heard it before. Oh, my God. So you know that move they use when they hook the abdominal stretch close to the ropes yep. and you reach down and you pull the guy's trunks up? Yep. <laughs> oh, my God. They were saying shit like, throw him out here, Dutch. We know what to do with him. Oh, <laughs> and and he got so mad. Like, fuck this man. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. You know, what am I going to do? He didn't like it. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the dressing room. I said, well, go back. I'm not stopping you. Leave if you want to. But he didn't. But, oh, it made him it made him so mad. So, but I'm back there what, doing Dundee's match because we have two single matches like we did in the other prison and then a tag team match. <clears throat> so I'm there and I notice everybody has their little sections. The black guys are over here, and the Aryan nation, the white guys, they're like over there, and the Hispanics are back there, and then the Hispanics are over here, so the Latinos, then the gay guys, they're all together, but none of them were mixing with each other, so that goes to tell you how how separated that, that, that prison is. Who the hell but books I, I, you at the prison, though? Who, who's actually getting you that no, booking? No, that is such a weird no. booking. You never heard of that before? No, it's kind of... No, no, they would, they would call up. They would call up the, the wrestling office. 
and they'd say, and, but this was in Tennessee. They would just call Jerry Jarrett's office and say, hey, could we book uh, a, it's not a, it's like a benefit show, but it's not, but it's because they have a fund where they can bring in entertainment for, and it's not big. Right. Can we can we bring in enter, entertainment for the inmates? They they might bring in a little band, or they might bring in you know, and I'm sure they didn't spend a lot of money on this show, but I see it paid pretty good, to tell you the truth. And the state pays for it, or an ed, or some kind of a entertainment fund. I don't know, but that's who that 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 pays for it. The state pays for it, but. uh so I'm there, I'm sitting in the back and I'm watching this and I'm saying, and it took me about halfway through the show. I'd already been out there and I went, where in the fuck's the security? And then I looked around, guess what? No security on the floor. Whoa. Nothing. Nothing. Whoa. Wow. Because, because we had a, a, a guard, he wasn't a guard, but he was in the back. And I asked him, I said, where's the security? He said, oh, you don't have any security on the floor. I said, well, what are you? He said, I'm a trustee. And a trustee is a prisoner. So I said, where's the, where's the uh, security? He said, oh, if you look up there in the corner, you'll see a, like a little guard house in the corner of the, it's got the glass in front of it and everything. That's where they are. There was no security on that floor. If something happened now, you're just on your own, I guess. I don't know. Wow, that's so anyway, kind of scary. A little scary. So here's a story. I saw this big guy. He was tall. He was 6'8", six, 6'10", six, with long hair, like like dark, dark hair, but with glasses, sunglasses on, of course, with the prison uniform on. And he was standing there with his arms folded, like in one of the corners looking in, and all by himself. And I kept watching him, and nobody messed with him. Nobody said, the black guys didn't have any interaction with him. None of the white guys, none of the Latino guys, none of them, none of them, any of them, none of them. But he's just standing there, and I'm thinking, who is that guy? Because they left him alone. I asked my little trustee friend, I says, well, he wasn't a friend, but he was then. So I said, who's that guy? He said, oh, Nobody leaves him alone. I said, why? He said, well, what? he said, he's, he's here for life. He said, he killed about four or five people one night. What? He said, he was riding a bicycle. He's a bicycle. He's a motorcycle guy. And he broke down on the road. Some guy stopped. He needed a part for his motorcycle. They went in town to the motorcycle shop. It wasn't open, so they broke in. And <clears throat> he got the part he needed, I guess. Went back, they fixed his fixed his motorcycle, and then he killed the guy on the side of the road. Jesus. And I don't think it fit. I think he killed the guy on the side of the road, took his car and went and robbed a store, killed two more people, and then killed two more people somewhere else. Wow. So he had a he had a kill in that. So I can see why people left him alone. See, in prison, you are you are judged on the crime you went in for. If you went in there for murder, people leave you alone. Because you've already murdered once. And maybe that didn't stop you. And the ones who get treated the worst are the child molesters. Those are the ones who get beat up and, you know, killed. And Because a lot of those guys probably got molested when they were kids too. And they, they, they just kind of make it even. But anyway, that was one of the craziest places I ever wrestled. That right there. So, but but I bet or, you never wrestled in a cave. That's what I'm gonna gonna guess. I did wrestle in a cave, <laughs> and, and that's that's and that was in Kentucky too. It was called Horse Cave. Imagine that a place called it was a cave named Horse Cave, and it was like back in a mountain, and they had turned it into a. And it was a real cave. They had just hollowed it out. And it was like, a, it was almost like a little arena that would seat 500 people. And they had a little stage and a place to put a ring. But the cave, but the cave what made it unique was they had bats in it. And bats would just fly around the ring. You know, crazy, 
crazy. Yeah, stuff. That's, that's crazy. Another place I wrestled one time, and this was in Atlanta, and it was during the hot summer, was just car dealerships. Hmm. God. I was showed up one day this car dealership is like a Cadillac dealer. And I'm thinking, God, it was like 105 degrees outside. So you can imagine asphalt, how it takes that heat and holds it. Oh, my God. So we walked out there with that heat coming up off that asphalt. It had to be 110. Had to be. But one thing I didn't know, I wrestled an old timer, and he knew this. I didn't. When a ring sits out there in front of the in in the sun, what happens? Burns, right? Heats up. The mat gets hot, really hot. So I was gonna go out there and try to wrestle this guy around, and he's trying to <coughs> tell me to stay on my feet. So he took me down. He didn't take me in a headlock, take me down, because that would make him on the mat too. He yanked the leg out and put me down, and my back hit that mat. It's like 120. It was it, it burned me really, and I was kicking and screaming and trying to get up. And we had people a, around the ring, and I'm thinking, why in the hell would people come out here and stand around in a 105 degree temperature to see this? So that was uh, I, I never want to do that again. So Yeah, not fun. That sounds horrible. No, and I, when I went back to the dressing room, I went into the bathroom. They didn't, of course, they didn't have a shower room. I went into the bathroom and poured water on me. I, I didn't give a crap whether I got on the floor or not. I didn't care. But you know when it's so hot, steam comes off you. You know it's really, yep. really, really hot. So, hey, this is another place I wrestled on a NASCAR racetrack. Oh, cool. That was probably hot as hell down there, too. Well, it wasn't too bad. It Depending was on night. the month. Well, it was kind of at night. It wasn't too bad. It was like kind of late in the year, too. But I, And I remember who I wrestled. Russell Tracy's mother's again. We bring his name up twice. And the match starts in front of the of the, the grandstand. The, the oh. grandstand, the middle part of it. And we start, and we start around. And the track moves about, the truck moves, and there's, there was a ring on the back of an 18-wheeler. And we got in, and of course, the the, the 18-wheeler rail, rails, you could see, and they just put the ring on top of that. And we went around the ring slowly, about five, maybe three miles an hour. And we go around the ring, and the announcer would call what's happening and I, I remember I forgot who I was wrestling here somebody else and he was beating the shit out of me and because he was half drunk because they'd give us beer in, a, in the convenience booth we were in <clears throat> I told him I said brother quit hitting me so goddamn hard <laughs> I said I'm the only one can feel it those people are half a mile away I, they can't see it but I can I can feel it so stop it so we went around the ring, and conveniently, the match ended right when we got back in front of the grandstand. Of course. Ironically, right? Yes. Coincidence. Right. Coincidence. Okay, I, I'm sure. Here's another thing. I wrestled in front of a, what's that called? What's it called when you make sounds with drums and stuff? What's that called? Like a music hall or something? It was it was a music hall. I don't know what that's. It's like anything that makes a thumping sound, like a drum. I don't know. I'll think of it in a minute. But it was a an orchestra, and it was a uh, Wichita State Orchestra. And me and Jeff Jarrett, we had this match at the Louisville Center for the Performing Arts, and. One Tuesday afternoon before the matches in Louisville, and match went about ten minutes. And it's the damnedest thing you ever saw in your life because it didn't make a damn bit of sense. But they were going to beat drums and you know drill, you know, yep. to beat up concrete and anything that makes a like a sound like that is. I can think of the name in a minute, but I'm missing it. And it's still, I think you can still see it on uh, 
on YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah, I've seen it on YouTube. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And what it was, it was supposed to be that they, they wanted to tell a story and and I forgot what the story was now, but but the guy was some kind of a an artistic type and he wanted that. So we did it. It was pretty good, I guess. He liked it. So I mean, I didn't much like it. I mean, I didn't much care for it because I didn't see the I didn't see the, the intent of it. <clears throat> but then again, what do I know? <clears throat> I'm just a red boob from out in the country. But and that was <laughs> See, I was trying, I wrestled on a barge one time in Miami Bay. This when I was in Florida. And I wrestled Steve Kern. And the thing about, you know, you wrestle guys like that. And, you know, I was young and he was young. And, and the reason they had barges is the reason that came up is because of gambling. That's why the gambling offshore on the Mississippi River, they could put it on a barge. Right. And it and it'd be legal for some reason. So they put they had a barge to do that. And so they just put a a ring out there and so the people would walk into the barge. And of course it didn't leave the dock. But we would fight all over the place. And I remember uh, Steve throwing me into the into the bay, and me picking myself out, and it was fun though. That was good. So, hey, I wrestled in a women's prison one time too. Oh, you probably love that. Nice. That was in Puerto Rico, and I'm thinking, and that was really really different because they really really reacted. It was almost like having women go to the men's to the men's. Uh, prison so we went to their prison very interesting because they're always speaking spanish i don't know what they were saying but but they really enjoyed it they really did okay i wrote you something else down there too what was it you wrestled maybe some bars and some churches i wrestled a lot of bars i hated that bar stuff because you'd bust out there on the dance floor you had no room at all you'd almost have to fit the ring into places where you could get it through the get it through the like the the stands in the floor to hold up the ceiling. Yep. I don't know. It was and you might have 10 people, 15 people, 20, 30. But and I don't even think they even charged charge people to come in. I think they just sold them beer and we sold the show. I don't know how even how that worked. So what was that other thing I had? Did you uh, say churches and courts too? Didn't you wrestle in in some other like insanely weird places like that? Wrestled inside a church one time, which is very very odd to wrestle into a in, in a church, and you get out there and it's it's just a bad it's just a weird feeling to get out there and you know people are gonna be coming in there Sunday and you know, Wednesday night and having services and you're out there doing whatever you're doing. I never really, but I think while we was even there, because I think the preacher was somewhat, he had somewhere, somewhat to do with wrestling somehow, but I don't, I don't know what. So. Seems hey, like you, a weird place for violence. You know what I mean? Like a church, you're going to have violence in the church. It seems like kind of a weird spot. You think? A little bit. See, see well, they did have a show. I think Russo had a show one time. Geared Ring of Glory. For, exactly. Geared for geared for churches. Right or not? Yeah, the Ring of Glory, yeah. So I I never understood how that worked. I never did. So it was something else I wanted to talk to you about today. Can't remember what it was. Of course, hey, when we do this show, people, hey, we don't plan nothing. We just get out here and we just start talking. Now, now, John, they're all telling each other, no shit. You, you're telling us now. We, fig <laughs> we figured that out about 30 minutes ago. You guys don't know where the hell you're going. <laughs> so there was something about, did I ask you last week about uh, 
you know, Trump's got so much heat on him. Mm-hmm. Did I mention that there, there was some talk about them kicking Trump out of the WWE Hall of Fame? Yeah, we we talked about it last week with uh, Foley. Mick Foley had said that he wanted him out of the Hall of Fame. But I don't ever think that will happen. I really don't. Do you? No, it's Vince's buddy. And what does that have to do with the WWE Hall of Fame, like him being – you know, a good president, bad president, whatever. Like, what does that matter? Just WWE Hall of Fame. Who cares? It has nothing to do with it. Well, <clears throat> I looked into the, uh, like the O.J. Simpson. You know, they got, even if, he, if he'd been convicted, I don't, still don't think they would have kicked him out of the pro football Hall of Fame. Right. Because the rules say it, it's based on what he did during his career. Not what crimes he committed, or any of that stuff, which I kind of agree with. So, I don't know. It's like taking away titles. I, I hate that in college football. You can't take away titles and in, in, in awards. They already won it. You could take it away years later and pretend they didn't, but too bad they already won it. They got the award. He's in the Hall of Fame. Too bad. Let it go. Move on. Like the same people were trying to say the thing about Snuka, and they were getting on Foley for Snuka because uh, you know he. They were saying he was guilty for murder or allegedly guilty for murder so he shouldn't be in there but you can't take anybody out it's already over and done with they're in yeah. they're in well this is this is my bitch about it it's that cancel culture let's take away all the stuff you've done because somebody else and it wasn't even proven let's just take it away because we think you may have done it i hate that i mean if you want to look back in somebody's past yeah, there's a lot of things you can dig up, but is it enough to kick them out of the Hall of Fame? And I think if I, even if OJ had been convicted, yeah, and I think a lot of people they think he did it. I think he did it. Do you think Absolutely. he did it? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, who else could do it? Who else would want to do it? Tell you the truth, of course he had to do it. I don't know how he got how he got by with that. But I don't know. Johnny Cochran, I guess. If the glove don't fit, must have quit. Yep, he's got good lawyers. That's how he got out of that and, one. Well, and he, and he got out of it. He, he really did. All right, folks, we're going to hop off here today. I hope you enjoyed it. You can get a hold of me at DirtyDutchMantel at gmail.com. If you have a subject you want me to talk about or a question, uh, you can write to me there. And uh, you can uh, go to my website, which is under, John, you won't believe this, but it's under rewrite right now. Whoa. This is, this is like the 14th time. It's like Trump being impeached. Just do it every, <laughs> just do it every other week, you know. <laughs> so at Dirty Dutch Mantel at, at gmail.com and at Facebook, and I, I'm I'm getting a, a better appreciation for Facebook now because, you know, if you put something up over there and just leave it alone a while and go back, I'll have like 100 comments. And then, of course, it takes me like an hour to go through. And, you know, it's very thoughtful material. But that's that's just Dutchman Tail at, at Facebook. And Instagram is what, Dirty Dutchman One, John? Yes. Yep. Okay. That's over there. So if you got anything... Let me know. I have, I have signed autographs for sale, uh, individual customized autographs. You can find about that. Uh, you can write me about that on my email, or you can find that on my on my website. And I got some more stuff I'm gonna put up for sale. And I got a bunch of old stuff, old old stuff that uh, that investors would be would be interested in. So I can't tell you exactly what it is because I got to put it all together. I opened the door to my closet the other day, John. Couldn't even get in there. Uh-oh. I swear. Hell, they could have been a body in there. And I, I couldn't have got in there and, and drug them out. I said, damn, how did this get this way? I don't know. Is it wrestling stuff or is it like no, it's, clothes? It's, stuff? No, no, it's not so much clothes. It's, it's like journals and it's like magazines and it's like, I still have a couple of whips somewhere that I don't know where, where they are. Whoa. They may be, 
They actually may be in another location, as far as I know. Hey, I just wish I had the stuff I threw away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you have old boots and stuff? Well, I got rid of all the boots, most of them. I still got a pair somewhere. Don't know where they are, though. So I need to I need to check around with some of this stuff. See, I got a, st- uh, uh, a still a couple of, like, what's it called? Storage bins mm-hmm. in places that, you know, I got it. This other guy got it, and I just stored it in his place. It's, it's his, really. I need to tell him to look in there and see what's in there. So unless he's already looked, he's already sold the stuff himself. Who knows? You cannot tell about the caliber of my friends sometimes. You may yeah. think you have something and, it, and it's gone. Anyway, same, folks. Same here. Same thing happened to me. Same. What, what happened to you? Hey, I read about same, it. Let me, same let me exact thing. You. What, somebody sold you stuff? Yeah, don't they? They were holding my stuff, and they sold a bunch of it, and they ended up having to give me the money for the stuff that they sold because it, it was it was gone. So I was like, okay, where's the stuff? If there's no stuff, you have to give me the money for the missing stuff. So yeah, crazy stuff, crazy. So they gave you money though. Yes, finally. So yeah. So you're not totally out of it. No, not totally. John, what is Bitcoin? What is that? Isn't it some sort of uh, financial way of, of exchanging money without actually having physical money? I don't even know how the increments work or whatever it's it is. A, to me, I think it's a money alternative, and they deal with each other, and they can actually buy from each other actual merchandise, I think. I don't know. But this guy I was reading about today, he put a bunch of Bitcoin is it actual coins or is it certificates? I don't think it's real. Co- it's coins. I think it's just money. It's like the money alternative. It's just some sort of uh, virtual well, kind of money or certificates or whatever. It's not real coins. Or it's not real cash. Well, he put all this money, whatever, into this vault chest or lockbox or something. And he cannot remember the password. Oh, Jesus it's a, Christ. It's it's a number password. Oh, wow. And and you only have 10 tries to get it or it's locked forever. And he's gone through eight so far. Oh, boy. And it's worth $220 million. Not, in, act, not in actual dollars, but in Bitcoin currency. That's what it's worth. I don't think the guy misses it because he's a multi, multi, multi millionaire. I mean, I don't know how rich you are, but you'd miss two hundred twenty million. I don't, I don't care how how rich you are. Yeah, no doubt but about he, it. But he's had he's had some people, and he he made up the password ten years ago. That's why he can't remember it. Crazy, huh? That's nuts. Yeah, that's insane. I read about that today. Anyway, hey, to, to next week, folks. Uh, write me, tell me how you like the show. Write John and tell him the show would be a lot better if he kicked that other guy off, that guy with the mustache. It would be a lot better. <laughs> and uh, so to everybody, uh, take care of yourself. Uh, wear the mask if you don't have a lot of constitutional issues with it. Wear the mask. Or if not, just wear the mask just to get along. That's that's what I'd say. You, you may not agree with it. But I think, don't you think wearing the mask is a lot better than arguing with a bunch of people, John? Yes, that's why I like wearing it. Just, just wear the mask. It's not yeah. no big deal. It's, it's not like you can't breathe or nothing. I mean, I mean, all these people all of a sudden, I kind of agree with them, but I kind of not. All of a sudden, they, they turn into these damn constitutionalists who <laughs> probably never even read the Constitution before in their life, and now, now they're big defenders of it. Anyway, so folks, take care of yourself. Stay safe. Uh, we'll be back next week. I hope you liked the show today. And, uh, hey, if you uh, run across some homeless people, I say this every week, and I mean this, uh, help them as much as you can because they are really, really, really going through a tough time now. I mean, if if we're going through a tough time just being separated, those homeless people on the street are going through a, a rougher time and a more – more of a time that they don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow because they may live under that, that, uh, that guys all the time anyway. So 
All right, I want everybody who's a real American to please rise, put your hand over your heart, and in a loud, clear voice, say along with me, we, the people. See you next week.